Turning to education, additional funding for state colleges and universities may reportedly be held hostage by Republicans if the UW system does not agree to eliminate offices related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, a trend being seen nationwide. Now, this news comes the same week a social media video of a UW-Madison student hurling racist slurs has gone viral. Outrage over the students' comments prompted protests on campus and a list of demands from the student-led Black Power Coalition delivered to the office of UW-Madison Chancellor Jennifer Mnookin, including academic accommodations, mental health resources, and expulsion of the student in the video. I would say that a lot of students' initial thoughts were shock, confusion, and pain. Unfortunately, acts like these are not uncommon here, and we decided that this was the time to really band together in order to make these things not continue to be a reoccurrence. Manukin's response condemned the racism in the video and acknowledged concern for the harm caused, but stopped short of disciplinary action, saying, quote, As to the individuals within the racist video, there are numerous legal constraints, both on what we can say and what we can do as a public university. Even though the video is both hateful and harmful, I know that is not what you want to hear, but we are also bound to obey the law. Despite that, more than 50,000 people have signed a petition calling for the student in the racist video to be expelled. Here to talk more about all of this is UW-Madison Interim Provost Eric Wilcox. And thanks very much for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, tell us why the university cannot discipline this student. Yeah, it's a great question and one we get a lot. And we have, I know folks are not happy with that answer, but let me point to a couple couple of things. One is with federal law, particularly something called FERPA, which I'm sure you're familiar with, we can't speak about an individual case, right? The other thing is we have seen cases after case, and it's really established case law, of instances at a public university where this kind of speech, as abhorrent as it is, as horrible as it is, is protected speech under the First Amendment. Because of that, we are not able to get act on, on this, even though this speech is absolutely abhorrent, because it is protected legal speech under the First Amendment of the country. So black student leaders uh, told us that they were disappointed in the response to the situation by the chancellor, uh, as it didn't feel, they said, like a call to action. Mm -hmm. What's your response to that? I think the, the, the chancellor's communication and response you know, starts out first by she and the entire leadership team are are deeply, deeply hurt by this. This is abhorrent, right? And we do apologize to the students and, and other members of our community, right, who are offended by this. This is this is horrible. So staying that, then what is it can that we can do going forward to to be better? And that's something that we as a campus I think have been really dedicated to, particularly over the past few years. We've gotten a, we've moved in a lot of great directions in this space. Um, I want to point to the Rebecca M. Center, the Rebecca M. Blank Center that we have. Uh, that is the extension of the public history project that we did last year with with, with sifting and, and, and reckoning. So we're making steps. We have increased the diversity of the student body overall over the past few years. And I deeply recognize I've been on this campus 27 years. We have not made great progress in increasing the percentage of, of black students on our campus, and we need to do better, right? And we will continue to work towards doing better. So we are making steps, and the, the students had a, a, in their, their demands, I think, a set of issues where we, as campus leadership, really want to sit down and think about how can we, how can we move forward on a number of the things that they are interested in. Uh, and that's, I think, the conversation that we have to have going, going forward. You just spoke about the kind of lack of diversity, particularly uh, diversity of black mm -hmm. students uh, on this campus and uh, system-wide. Yep. Yep. System-wide, it sits at something like 2.9% of the student Correct. population. So how do you change that? With a lot of hard work. Right. And I think well, some of that hard work has happens on, on our admission side, on our outreach into different communities to recruit students to come to UW-Madison. Part of that is our ability to bring scholarship and other dollars to the table to make to take that financial concern off the table to be able to recruit students. Part of that is what kind of programming do we have? Right? What kind of academic programs do we have that excite students about, about being here? 
It looks like you're about to jump in. But I, can... I was going to ask, as part of that, the culture that these uh, students a, find part here. Part of that is the, is the culture, right? And that is, if you've listened to, to Chancellor Mnuchin's uh, sort of words over the past few months, particularly in her investiture speech, a clear focus on what she is calling flourishing. And that is that notion that we all belong at UW-Madison, regardless of our race, our gender, our ethnicity, to get that sense of belonging so that we can all flourish here. And that is dealing with that, that cultural piece. How do, we, how do we do that? How do we begin to change minds? And I think one of the things that has emerged over the past 48 hours, and I've seen a lot of email from different academic units on campus, doing a bit of that self-reflection, saying, okay, what is it that we need to be doing within our particular unit to make sure that our climate, our culture, is one that is welcoming and inclusive of, of all? How much does this kind of thing set all of that back? It's, it's a ding, right? It, it, it's a ding, right? We will, we, it, we will have to, it's a, it's a step backwards. We're gonna have to keep charging forward, right? And I think we're all dedicated to doing that. I know I've been, since I've been on campus 27 years, I've been a dean for the last four years. I see within my colleagues, across leadership, across campus, a real commitment and a dedication to not just that, the demographics, right? And I think we're all in that sort of an easy thing to say, boy, let's, let's improve our numbers. And we see that happening in the student body, we see that happening in the faculty, but how do we make sure we're changing that culture? Just super quickly, yeah. uh, before we go, I wanted to get your reaction to the idea that the Republican legislature would like to eliminate campus diversity offices in return for state funding. Right. I think that's a horrible idea, right? And I think this incident proves the need that we need to focus on making sure our campuses are open and welcoming for everybody. And that requires dedicated professionals who are in these positions who are allowing us to understand what are the best practices. And that's what these roles can, can deliver for our campus and to create the climate that our students are really asking for. All right, Eric Wilcox, thanks very much. Thank you, appreciate it.